Good morning. I know it's freaking early for tech guys. I'm sorry. But we need to see so much stuff in that we need to try to start a bit earlier than usual. Um, I directly have a lot of comments and we will really nice to see Good morning, thanks. So it's a, for, for a small enough here, we can really just make this more of a discussion than a presentation. It was even a discussion, it was a really good opportunity uh, given to me uh, by Marcus and Craig and Ed to kind of pontificate for a while. Uh, it's, uh, I, I've been involved, at, as you might know, as EFAS from the beginning with uh, James and, and a few other straight back, I think. Was it 2003 or four? Yeah. Uh, 2003. Uh, and uh, despite having been involved with NEPOS over that time, this is the first time I've actually had the opportunity to come to one of these events. So uh, it's great to be here and actually meet all of you and, and, and this community that I've actually uh, been a part of for more than 10 years now. So uh, I, I'm just going to talk uh, in general about what I see happening uh, uh, both in the, in the financial inclusion space and, and in broader tech space. And uh, what qualifies me to do that is uh, I'm a certified veteran now. <laughs> uh, I went to a conference uh, uh, about six months ago and suddenly introduced me as an industry veteran. And I thought, oh, I come on, I think I'm going to hang on. I suddenly realized that I've been in this industry for 35 years and I am a certified grandfather now. So you know, whether I like it or not, that, that makes me a veteran. <laughs> and uh, the, the good news is that once you, you uh, get that label put upon you, then, then it does uh, allow you a certain freedom to kind of pontificate and uh, tell everyone that uh, everything you see is on it, you, it's all happened before, etc., etc., etc. But, uh, you know, I, I started my life, as you can see from the first name, Jake. If you recognize the name Burroughs, that means you are over the age of 55. <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, the, but I mean, I still love this industry, and it's a crazy industry. Uh, it, it, as I say, it, it likes to breathlessly announce that uh, it has rediscovered fire every about 10 years or so. Uh, but uh, uh, it's a great industry, and it's given tremendous opportunities to people all over the world, uh, and certainly to me, and uh, I'm very grateful for it. Uh, I, I, uh, when I turned 60 last year, I promised myself that uh, no more direct reports. Freedom is having no employees. So I uh, stepped out of all of my operational roles, but I'm still very much involved in the industry. Investing in both uh, innovative companies, both for-profit and non-profit. You know, some of the for-profit companies are listed up there. Uh, they're small companies. Uh, doing interesting things, uh, and then of course I'm very much invested uh, in, in Mephus because I really believe in social engagement. Uh, my my uh, path into the space occurred actually out of a conference that took place in I think 1999 or 2000 in Seattle when this term digital divide <laughs> came into vogue. <coughs> so there has been a conference in Seattle in the on the digital divide, and there's a famous exchange, exchange for me to remember, between uh, Bill Gates and Mohammed Yunus of the Green Foundation uh, about whether technology mattered to the poorest of the poor. Uh, and Bill Gates paradoxically took the side that if you're living on less than a dollar a day, technology has no relevance to you. All you're worried about is where your next meal is coming from. Uh, whereas Mohammed Yunus took the opposite approach, uh, and that led to him inspiring a group of uh, folks in Seattle start what became the Grameen Technology Center. <clears throat> they then wrote me into that, and, I, and uh, out of that came, came Mephos. But I, but I do genuinely believe that those of us who have been fortunate enough to benefit tremendously from the technologies that the tech industry has provided have a responsibility uh, to give back, uh, and in particular a responsibility to give back through the technology channels, since that's what it, what it means for us to. So, Greatly benefit. Uh, I grew up in uh, in uh, South Africa, Southern Africa. Uh, I still go back there. In fact, tonight I'm flying to uh, uh, to South Africa and Namibia to uh, do what you do when you turn 60, which is try and in vain to recapture lost youth. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'm going to goof off and 
remote places and uh, pretend that I'm still 25 years old. Uh, my belief in uh, Mipos starts uh, with actually the founding Green philosophy that is uh, expressed by the Green Foundation, Green Bank in India, and Muhammad Yunus in particular, which is that uh, long term sustainable change actually only happens when people themselves change. Uh, that you, that above all, the most leveraged thing you can do is give people the opportunity to take control of their own destiny. Uh, and when you do that, then you can get systemic uh, change that endures over time. And couple that with uh, this concept uh, that uh, Daniel Spanier and Brock and, uh, and uh, Grameen around social capital, which basically just means people together are stronger than people alone. And so if you can get people into a community, uh, whether they be stand in charity for each other, in loans, or working together, you get a more powerful force. And uh, that's really uh, why I think Mipos uh, it's such an interesting endeavor because it embodies both of those principles. Uh, open source, if you look at it in a certain way, is a form of social capital. Uh, it's a way of where, by getting developers and others together, uh, they can be a much stronger force than any one of them could be individually. And the concept in Mifos that it is a platform in many senses of the word. Uh, it speaks to this idea of, of enablement, uh, that, that you're getting basically an opportunity now, not just for people, but for institutions to kind of take control of their own destiny, contribute back through open source, and, and get those two forces really working together. Uh, so for me, coming out of the tech industry, sort of having been exposed to the Green uh, Foundation philosophy, EFOS is a very powerful uh, vehicle of opportunity uh, to really be engaged uh, in the social world. So with that, I wanted to actually thank all of you, because you and your colleagues have made all this possible uh, over the years. Uh, this wouldn't have happened unless you and others had uh, seen the need and the opportunity here to come together, form a community, uh, and really put these principles to work. And uh, it's been extraordinarily satisfying for me. A lot of turns and twists along the road, the Nephos Road. I uh, regret to see a now 13, 14 year vision starting to actually become a significant force in the world. Uh, so I want to thank all of you. And we can all take a moment here to bask in our glory uh, <laughs> and, and move on. But, Taking a step backwards, sir, and getting into the pontification phase of my talk, uh, the, it's a fascinating time. Uh, you know, as I said, it's always been a fascinating time for the technology industry, but now it's a particularly fascinating time for the technology industry. And I'll, I'll sort of explain why, because I, we're in one of those major shifts uh, that are enabled by fundamental changes in the underlying hardware. At the end of the day, applications and software are really enabled my hardware, uh, and I'll explain that in a second. But you have these four big inter interacting forces. Uh, you've got the consumer digital world really driving uh, computing and software architectures today uh, because they allow basically uh, not just tens or hundreds of millions of people, but billions of people to get connected to the internet that requires new architectures, new ways of uh, exploiting resources you see the changes that are happening in institutions, particularly in the financial services space. Uh, uh, you know, it's very fashionable now to talk about the disaggregation that's going to happen in financial services as the big banks find themselves pulled apart into various pieces and face new competition from new entities. I think that uh, provides us uh, and the NEFOS community a tremendous opportunity. Uh, the emphasis on digital governance, in other words, how can we use inclusion of technology to improve the processes of governments, whether it be how we handle contracts, uh, digital money, uh, all of those kinds of things are now being actively thought about. Uh, and then, you know, the, the technology that is changing in response to these demands. So mm -hmm. these kind of things are all feeding on each other. And you're interested to see things like Bitcoin that start in the consumer world, uh, now having, you know, huge impact 
fund both institutions and the financial services industry as they realize the potential of not necessarily Bitcoin itself, but blockchain as a way of clearing transactions. And, and as I said, now people are thinking of it as a way of uh, keeping track of and enforcing contracts, uh, all of which are huge activities that are very expensive and cumbersome to do today. So these, uh, these forces all play together and, and are accelerating each other, which is why it's becoming an interesting time. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the technology side of that. Uh, and first I just want to say a word about open source. Uh, one of the things I realized is open source is important not just because it's free. A lot of these are great, you know, we're going to use open source because it's free, we don't have to pay. Well, you know, in, in reality, that's important, but many institutions don't actually mind paying for value. Uh, and in fact, very few institutions uh, are going to take over in a journey unless they feel like they have a trusted partner with them and they're willing to pay for that. But why open source uh, is important to these other factors, as I said, first of all, it's empowerment, uh, and uh, it's important for social capital. Uh, it, but above all, it is the way that the industry standardizes today. It used to be that we would do standards by forming standards committees, and uh, you know, we'd have the old ISO 7 layout model, et cetera, et cetera, and it was incredibly, basically a failed experiment. Uh, and instead, the industry has found open source as a way of basically standardizing by actually going and building an instance of the standard and allowing multiple people to participate and benefit from that. And if you get that force working, that becomes a very strong uh, force that it's very hard to resist uh, because if there's a good open source vehicle available, well, why would you not use it? Uh, so you, if you look at uh, Almost all of the new technologies we'll talk about in a second that are, that are coming out of the quote unquote cloud based world, whether it be the new family, et cetera, it's all open source. And it's open source not because it's free, it's open source because that's the way the industry has found uh, to be effective in terms of innovating and standardizing at the same time. So, uh, what we're doing is, is, is pushing very much aligned with that. Uh, when we started on this journey in you know, 2003, this much more of a you know, avant-garde thing to do, but uh, but now I think we're, we're exactly in the right space, and, and we really have the opportunity, as we'll see later, to become a standard, if not the standard, for basic financial services software, uh, if we can deliver them all the things that uh, we're working on. But the one thing I you know, wanted to caution, uh, you know, even though, as I said, uh, Mifos, the strength is it is a platform. The one hard lesson that I learned spending 35 years of my life trying to build platforms is basically apps become platforms, not the other way around. In other words, you have to have enough of a solution for people to be able to use the platform immediately. Uh, if you put a platform out there and you tell everyone, oh, okay, you know, it's somebody else's job to write the initial set of applications, then you can be waiting there for a very long time indeed. Uh, in fact, most platforms start as some form of an app uh, that then later gets disaggregated and the platform gets extracted out of it. Uh, which means we need to remember that whenever we do MIFOS, we need to make sure that there is a, a large enough constituency of uh, users who can use our product quote unquote out of the box. Uh, because unless you can do that, you're going to delay this whole virtuous cycle from getting into action. So, even though I think we have a tremendous opportunity, it will be the standard platform for in the financial, one of the standard platforms in the financial services space. We need to really remember our roots and remember that we have to make sure we make sure that a critical mass of our current users can use whatever technology in a very straightforward way uh, in order to get that positive feedback loop working. So, this is. Uh, more of a, a, a reflection on sort of what's driving those you know, big cycles of change. And uh, I've been in this industry long enough to, to sort of see two entire eras. Uh, I was born in the technology industry. My first job was in London in 1978, in the tail end of the, the mainframe era. Uh, and that's where I went to work for Burroughs. And uh, I was a newly minted computer science graduate, and I thought I was going to go work on operating systems. 
And instead, because I came from the Southern Hemisphere and I came out of cycle, so I started working in January, February instead of, you know, August, September, they didn't know what the hell to do with me. All right, so they gave me the firmware to debug the firmware of the, of the printer in the world's first ATM machine. And it was a 12 bit microprocessor. Yes, there were such things. Uh, and, uh, it was a big cut down for me, you know, that I thought, oh, you know, you know, I was going to go with an operating system if you're not trying to find a bug in the assembly code of a 12 bit microprocessor. Uh, the, uh, in, in, in reality, it turned out to be an incredibly uh, fortuitous event in my life because it took me on a different route, which put me into gave me a ringside seat in the next year, which was a PC client server web area. Because from that, I got a job at Intel, uh, Microsoft, etc., and uh, was able to see that whole era sort of almost uh, from start to its, its current material position. And, uh, now we're going into basically the third era, which you can put a different, whatever label you like to it, but this is the general one, uh, where it's driven by a different set of needs because each of these major areas are really characterized by the uses to which the computing equipment was being put to. Uh, if you look at the mainframe area, it was really defined by the automation of financial accounting. Uh, and it, that drove a set of architectures, so most of those apps were built on ISAM file systems, etc., which are fine if all you're doing is basic general ledger stuff. Uh, and uh, then what happened, as you'll see, is something in a lot of uh, the world ago after basically not just doing financial calculations, but actually tackling the automation of most of the paper based processes in the world. So, People like myself self spent the 80s and 90s uh, uh, trying to automate, for instance, the life of a white collar worker sitting behind their desk, which is why on your laptop today you have a desktop and files and folders and inboxes and outboxes, because we just took that metaphor and said, how do we automate that? And that was an incredibly successful journey. Uh, today, most of the paper based processes. Uh, actually have been automated as a whole industry came up uh, around that has been very successful. And as I said, you can see uh, at the line that basically the typical architectures that just like the mainframes, you know, sat on the uh, ISAM systems, the uh, PC client server typically, typically was sat on the professional database. And, and, uh, that was occasioned by essentially the change that really enabled that was CPU cycles from a programmer's perspective became free. Uh, in all mainframe games, you literally counted the CPU cycles that you expended. When you got a microprocessor, the <coughs> CPU cycles were free. Who cared if you wasted the microprocessor's time? The old mainframe program would be horrified to find out that you know most of the time this laptop's just sitting there doing precisely nothing, expanding billions and trillions of cycles. Uh, if it's free, who cares? Uh, and so all of a sudden, you could do things like a graphical user interface or a relational database that are, by mainframe standards, extraordinarily CPU intensive. Uh, because they're free, by not mention more about it, etc. Uh, so we, we, we've seen the basic uh, outline standard application architectures, three tier relational database, etc. Very well understood, very mature. And, and as you all know, certainly MIFOS 1 and to some extent MIFOS X is an instantiation of that architecture, which is fine for its, its current uses. Then, uh, you know, what happened was that uh, people started to go after things that are inherently beyond paper. Uh, there is no paper equivalent of Facebook or Google search, etc. Uh, and uh, they, in turn, those kind of applications were even more demanding resources, but fortunately, Things changed because now with the cloud, the big change from the developer's perspective is it's not just CPU cycles that are quote unquote free, it's actually machines with their own memory spaces that are free. Uh, so if you really look at the cloud as an architecture as opposed to a place of doing computing, you think say what's really profound about the cloud is not simply that you can load a three-tier app into Amazon and run it there. What's profound about it is you as a developer can ask for Ten, a hundred, a thousand machines, and I can use them for the next thirty seconds, and then give them back. Uh, and that opens up these opportunities for parallelization. You know? And if you look at the consumer world, 
the architectures that they're using they're exemplified by things like the viewbridge that you're lying here, the paralyzed architectures. Uh, so they are attacking these new paper-based processes by trading in this new free currency of lots and lots and lots of machines. At the same time, you know, fortunately, uh, we've also got not only that, that you've got the connectivity costs coming down dramatically uh, to the point where you know, a megabit per second or so of, of, of connectivity on a geographically distributed basis by historical standards is going to become free. Uh, and the actual you know, CPU cycles themselves continue to get uh, even more plentiful as evidence of these smart devices that are out there. So now we're looking at a situation where not only did we manage to get billions of people attached to the internet, but in the next you know, five to ten years, we're going to get hundreds of billions of things attached to the internet. Uh, you can go you know, to General Electric actually today and buy the first IPv6 in the English light bulb. Uh, so it's a light bulb that literally has a light, little microprocessor built into it, an IPv6 address screwed in. And in theory, you can talk to every light bulb individually as a mode on the internet. Uh, so that's where all of this is going, it's really driving this change. So that is over a period of time, you know, reflect or match. It's not that these architectures go away because for certain things they're just fine. You know, if you go back to any major bank in the world and scratch them a little bit, you'll actually find the mainframe with an old ISIN still running, they're still chugging away, still maintaining your accounts because they do <coughs> an adequate job in them. There's not really much incentive to change. Simply for a lot of the uh, you know, client server world, it's not really an incentive to change. Uh, but what we're seeing now is, is the emergence of a set of techniques that really exploit those unique features of the cloud. And uh, so we're moving from the cloud simply as being a place to do computing to being an architect to do computing. And that's what people are starting to use this phrase cloud native for. So, so what, if, what is the architectural pattern that will really characterize this era versus the standard three-tier pattern that characterized that era? And we're now far enough into it actually to actually see the broad outlines of what a cloud native architecture looks like. And I'll, I'll characterize that for you in a second. So uh, what is a cloud native app? Well, it, it generally is accepted as having the following attributes. Uh, it should be highly scaled. Uh, in other words, you should be able to take advantage of what the cloud makes plentiful, which is, um, quote unquote, from a developer's perspective, unlimited number of cores, memory in particular, and very inexpensive storage in order to be able to rapidly expand to handle almost any loads of any size. The second thing is it needs to be resilient because if you really are going to be a truly cloud native service, you never get taken down. When you launch a cloud native service, it runs forever. There's no concept of going down on Thursday night for two hours of you know, preventative maintenance or upgrades. You never hear Google taking their search engine down. That search engine, once it's launched, it's going to run forever. So you need architectures that allow you to basically upgrade in place. So you have to upgrade your components as the service is running. And you have to be able to react intelligently in the face of failure of underlying systems. So if certain parts of the infrastructure start to get slow or whatever, your application has to be smart enough to basically do the right thing, which means request resources from someone else, uh, change the flows of control or whatever, and do that all transparently so that the user never sees an interruption of service. Uh, it needs to be adaptable and accessible uh, because as I said, you're going to have to extend it while this application is running for very long periods of time. Uh, it has to be able to take advantage of the ecosystem now because people are building higher level services. And you can sort of think of it as these high level services. The collection of those services form, quote unquote, the new operating system. That's what you're doing. You're building apps that use Cassandra as a service or mobile payments as a service or whatever. So you that is the new extended environment to build applications and in turn expose itself as a service so others can do the same thing. So when people are thinking about building a modern application, you have to have these thoughts in the back of your mind. And uh, it, it, it's, if you want to do all of this, it's actually quite complicated. Uh, but the good news is there are now frameworks emerging 
that if you follow, uh, if you fit into the framework, you'll get these benefits to a large extent without you having to do the inordinate amounts of work. So just like we saw operating systems and graphical libraries and verbs that was easy, you go back to 1985 to write a truly Windows or Windows program is a complicated thing to do. And then we've got libraries that came out that you just hook up to and it handles all the mouse events in the window, C order and a lot of clipping and, and refresh and all of that for you. We're starting to see frameworks emerge now that do these things for you if you uh, take the step of fitting into the pattern that the framework wants you to follow. Do you take questions now? Or? Uh, yeah, sure. Just because it's super interesting. It's a little bit hard to get the full picture, you know, you. Um, so where would the, the fight between Amazon and Google with their Firebase and all of this come into? Are you yeah, so we're, we're, back to that, or? Yes, we're, we're an interesting predator in the sense that uh, we're seeing a battle unfold of the operating systems. <laughs> Yeah, the, the modern operating system. So Amazon, for instance, would love you to go and put your cloud app into the Amazon cloud, use all their high-level services. Uh, no, these days, it's not differentiating the, between the clouds. That they can all allow you to lo upload a set of Linux containers or a virtual machine. They can all run it. They can all give you a basic file system. They can all give you a basic block service. They can all give you, a, you know, basic whatever. But they're trying to not differentiate it is on these high level services. So Amazon wants you to use Amazon Redshift and they want you to use all these other things because once you do that, you're never leaving Amazon. You're essentially at that point using their proprietary APIs. Uh, and Microsoft to some extent is doing that with Azure, Google's doing that with the Google Compute Environment, etc. There is a movement against that which I wasn't going to get into. There's two ways of dealing with that. This is that uh, there are Fortunately, emerging in the industry, libraries that kind of cloak all of that. Uh, so, uh, I, I'll talk about one in particular in a moment, which is near and dear to our hearts, which is the broader emerging Spring framework. But uh, you've also got lower level uh, systems like Cloud Foundry that are trying to be kind of quote unquote the Linux for the cloud. So, they just like get you open. They, they basically are layered, you can layer on top of any cloud. And so long as you work with that, you can, give, you can get full portability across these clouds, just like you could, uh, you know, like Linux did for hardware. So if you think of these clouds as the new mainframes, the new hardware, the question is, where is the open operating system? Where is the Linux going to come from? And unfortunately, there are movements in the industry uh, to supply that. Uh, one that I personally involved with is one called Cloud Foundry that is run by the Cloud Foundry Foundation. It's an open source. Nonprofit foundation that is trying to develop that layer. Uh, there are others out there in the industry uh, as well. Uh, but really, you should be thinking even at a higher level than that because you want to get all of these benefits of, of scalability and resiliency, etc. So uh, let me just jump into that. I'll come back to this previous slide better in a second. So I mentioned one of these uh, frameworks is Spring Cloud. Now, Spring's actually been around for uh, uh, since about the year 2000, I think. Uh, uh, Spring's origin was, uh, if you close it around in 2000, was the sort of birth of the whole, uh, 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 you know, object-oriented frameworks, variety of client-server applications, Quover and, and EJB and things like that, and they were horrendously complicated, and, and a bunch of programmers, Rod Johnson and a couple of others in particular, revolted against that and said there has to be a simpler way of doing this. Okay. And, uh, they basically came up with a way of writing their application where you could write your objects in what they called POJOs, plain old Java objects. So you just wrote a Java class, you didn't have to know what context that class was going to run in or how to bind to other classes, except you just wrote your class. And then you essentially wrote a separate meta program that would stitch all of these classes together. So Spring introduced this concept, which had chosen to come to be a very powerful technique. Uh, called dependency injection or aspect oriented programming, which allows you to do meta programming on top of programming. Uh, if you did anything, you use Angular JS, for instance, which is one of the more popular uh, client side web libraries that, that uses uh, dependency injection to the hilt to basically do what it needs to do. 
Anyway, Spring uh, took off like wildfire, <coughs> and because it was somewhat simpler and easier to deal with than writing EJB applications, etc., uh, and uh, it became sort of the accepted way of writing enterprise Java applications, and it sort of went crazy, and then it sort of has it sort of chugged along uh, from about 2009 up until about 2013, 14, uh, when two things happened there. Uh, one is uh, the Spring community realized that they needed to simplify things further, so they came up with something called Spring Boot, uh, which is a way of basically taking us a Spring application and packaging it up with all of its dependencies in a single component so you could deploy it as a single blob, uh, because a lot of the other frameworks have allowed you to start doing that. Uh, and with the advent of you know, container-based things, there's a lot of Finally, to be able to get everything into a single manageable lump and just treat it that way. So Spring Boot took off like wildfire, uh, uh, and it's become sort of the accepted way in the Java community of writing <coughs> microservice grading and adapting and rewriting it where need, they need be to take advantage of what we're now understanding what it means to be to be cloud native. Uh, you know, by this time next year, I'm hopeful uh, that we can have a code base that will be world leading. It won't just be a code base to say, hey, this is a great thing for a small micro finance organization to run. We'll have a code base to say, hey, anyone in financial services should be able to take advantage of this code base. And, and of course, then I'm hopeful that you know we can go around and shape the tin cup and get the banks to start uh, contributing money, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but there's going to be a clear opportunity uh, in the space for a modern cloud native open source financial services platform. Uh, and uh, while we should never forget that our first job is to take care of the uh, hundreds of thousands of millions of, of people who rely on ethos services today, uh, we shouldn't be complacent either because nature abhors a vacuum. And if we leave the space open, somebody else will fill it and we'll find ourselves being less relevant rather than more relevant uh, in the future. All right. So I think we, we have a, a, an enormous opportunity to basically do uh, something that will be really innovative and something that will be very important. You know, I, I think you don't get a lot of opportunities in life, I, I've learned, to work on things that are really important. Uh, and it's, it's a privilege to work on things that are really important. Most people don't get that opportunity in life. Uh, and uh, we have an opportunity, so so let's take uh, on the one hand, let's have fun. On the other hand, let's take it seriously. So thanks a lot. It was great.